Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Julian, for the introduction. Okay, let's jump straight into, into this uh, topic for the talk. Uh, title of the talk is actually Social Realist Turns in Singapore Filmmaking. So I'll be mentioning works or writings uh, from be beginning from 1959 all the way up to works for until 1988, but mainly focusing on the 60s and 70s. You will realize that Social is in brackets because uh, I think I'll be speaking Probably two-thirds of the talk will be about social themes in films produced in Singapore. But maybe the last third will be more about uh, talking about realist approaches in documentary filmmaking or even in fiction filmmaking. So let's begin. So in yesterday's talk, I ended with a comment uh, on Chamiati's painting, the epic poem of Malia. And this, from this painting is where we will begin again today. So the focus that will begin today's talk in the painting is actually the book that the speaker is actually holding. A red book titled Epic a Poem of Malaya, Malaya Si Si. So I think this painting created in 1955 was uh, in a period where there was a, a nurturing of a Malayan consciousness, uh, seeking to develop like a Malayan culture amongst the population in Singapore as well as Malaya. And especially uh, this painting actually pertains to, I think, the Chinese population in Singapore and Malaya. So there's a process amongst cultural circles for uh, seeking to Malay Malayanize things, or in Chinese we call Malaya Hua. So uh, many publications have taken on a title with Malaya in them, including one that is written about film. And it is Malaya Hua, Hua Yi Dian Ying Wen Ting, Wen Ti, or the English name could be on issues of the Malayanization of Chinese language cinema. Okay, the author is actually Yi Shui, uh, which is a pseudonym of uh, Tang Pak Chi or Tang Bo Qi. So Yi Shui is actually born in Perak, and, but he eventually became like a Singapore citizen, and he's active in many places. He's moved around a lot. He, he, will, he goes back to China, he was in Penang, he was in Bangkok, and also obviously in Singapore as well, where he spent a significant time of his career. And so in, in this book, he publishes articles that he has uh, uh, contributed to Nanyang Shangbao. And in one of the essays titled, A Concise Answer to the Question, Can Malaya Produce Local Chinese Films? Okay, he was writing this essay when he was working in the Cathay organization, working as a distribution manager of uh, Chinese films made in Hong Kong. And so it's a pretty like, short essay. But in the essay, he actually makes a critique of the films that he was distributing, as well as the Malay language films that was made uh, in, in Singapore at that time. So he felt that the Malay language films were somewhat inadequate in, because they tell, felt that the films were very much about a Malay, the Malay lifestyle, Malay, Malay culture, which is, I, I don't agree with that statement actually, but that, that is his point of view. He was also critical of the films that he was Jewish building for Cathay, uh, man, many of which were Hong Kong, and some of which were about Malaya, about Singapore, so taking on Malaya themes or Singapore themes, but he felt the treatment uh, the rest, speaking about Malaya is often on a very superficial level, even cursory manner. So he was very critical of them. So he proposed producing Chinese language films that were very distinctly Malayanized, and he, he calls it Malaya Hua, Hua Yi Ding, okay, Malayanized Chinese films. And he even set criteria for these kinds of films that he sought to make. And he felt that the stories in the film should portray the reality of the lives of the Malayan people. And very importantly, the films should be created by Malayan talents. So not really produced by film studios in Hong Kong, but by film talent, film studios based in Singapore and Malaya. So to give you a f even broader context, so what are some of the Malaya theme films uh, that were created uh, up to the point before uh, Yi Shui wrote? The, his essays on the Malayan, Malayanization of Chinese language cinema. So as early as 1946, okay, this is a selection, okay, it's not exhaustive. Uh, there was a film documentary called Glory of Malaya, okay, it was made uh, with the Malayan People's Anti-Japanese Army, MPAJA. 
and even in 1954, there were two local films made in Singapore, Hokkien films, okay, uh, which one film scholar, Jeremy E. Taylor, has labelled as Malayan Amoy dialect realism. Uh, Amoy dialect actually refers to Hokkien, actually. They used to use the term Xia Yu, Xia Men Yu, so Amoy dialect. But it's actually, in today's, we use Hokkien to represent, uh, to, when we talk about that di particular dialect. So there are two Hokkien films, and the way they publicize the films is always Malaya. This is a Malayan film, using Malayan talent. Uh, but it's, to me, they are not really social realists because it deals with, uh, uh, rather it's set in a uh, family melodrama set in the middle class family. And unfortunately, these two films are lost. So there's not enough opportunity for a deeper, deeper analysis. And then there were the Hong Kong productions. So there were Hong Kong Cantonese production, taking on Malayan themes. Like, so you can tell by virtue of the titles, Malaya Love Affair, Moon of Malaya. So they were about Malaya, but treatment, as I mentioned earlier, very superficial, somewhat uh, cursory. Okay, even so, very interesting phenomenon. So they were creating Hokkien films, but in Hong Kong. So very little Chinese language films were actually produced in Singapore. In fact, they were actually produced by Hong Kong film studios, but bringing a filming crew to shoot like scenes around. But, so outdoor scenes were in, like in Singapore, Malaya, but indoor scenes were all shot in Hong Kong. And then the Malayanized, Malayanized Chinese films that Yi Shui actually eventually directed. Okay, so he went on to work with Kate to produce Kate Karis to produce Lion City. And and he after that he actually set up his own film company and produced Black Gold. Okay, I'll be speaking about these two films more later. And then some other film companies, independent film companies actually responded to his call for Malayanized Chinese films and created film titles or films like My Love in Malaya, Night Garden. Okay, these two films are also lost, we can't see them. Yi Shui also created a further two films with the titles Young Widow, Moon Over, Bentong Hill, and what he ter would label a term as Malayanized Chinese films. Okay, but they, I think they were completed. Reports uh, mentioned that they were completed, but they were never released. Okay, so I will go ahead and uh, talk more about these three titles. Okay, uh, first starting with Lion City. So this is actually the cover of uh, the film novel, uh, released in conjunction with the re release of the film, uh, Si Zicheng, uh, Lion City. And it's produced by Kete Keris, so this is the logo. So this is the only Mandarin film produced by the Kete Keris film studio. The rest of the films that they made, like numbering like 150 over films, were in Malay language. And there was some publicity in, in English as well, in the English media. So it was named the first Malayanized Chinese film. Okay, it's a new cultural presentation by director Tang Pek Chi. Okay, so, uh, there's, in the publicity notes, or rather the cover of the book, uh, there are mentions of what the film is about. So it portrays Singapore okay, from colony to self-governance, okay, uh, suggesting like a documentary mode in, although it's a fiction film, uh, it's in, in fact about a class divide romance. Okay, as you can see, the two lovers running across a lion sculpture, you know, and so this is this lion sculpture and the monument is actually part of the Medaka Bridge, which is still around today. Okay, the Medaka Bridge is part of the Nico Highway. Okay, and the name still exists. Okay, although the lions have been moved else, elsewhere, and the monument that structure is not standing anymore. And further mentions about what the film could be about. Okay, it's about Singapore essentially. And seeing Singapore, portraying Singapore as the crossroads of the Far East, the gateway to Malaya. So this is 1960, okay, released in 1960. So Singapore, I and mean, ma many people uh, in Singapore, including politicians, including social or cultural activists, they are looking to see Singapore as being part of Malaya. Uh, even Lee Kuan Yew sp sp speaks about merger with Malaya. So this film has to be uh, seen and uh, maybe analyzed in that context. So this film still exists, and in fact it's showing uh, soon uh, under the Asian Film Archives film program. 
I think on the 10th of August. But, so please do look out for it. And it's the restored version. So I have, a, I have a copy of the unrestored version, which has been shown broadcast on television. So I have a tape of it. So these are some scenes from the film. So you can see a representation of a reality that the people uh, were living through the times, that Singapore is seen as the port and Malaya as the hinterland. Okay, very well portrayed in the film. Okay, mentions about the shipping trade, scenes of the Singapore River, the landscape, the context, and in which the story, the romance story, is uh, 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 immersed in. And they spend significant effort in trying to uh, capture scenes of a rubber factory, one of the major exports of the, Mal uh, the Malayan natural resource, rubber, thin. So this one uh, it was shot in a rubber processing factory in Singapore. In fact, they went to two different factories. And so we have scenes of the female protagonist okay, working as a, a rubber, like cutting uh, on, a, on the production line or the processing line. So this is in the film. And for those who have watched the film, you have come across the scene where there was a night class taking place. Okay, very awkwardly inserted in the film, but very significant nonetheless. So this motive or this trope of a night class taking place okay, with students who are workers, adults, so they're not like school young children, they're actually working adults who are also students, actively self-improving themselves, continuing their education, although they are working as uh, laborers in a day. So this, in this film, a geography class was actually taking place and so the, the teacher was asking questions about what is Singapore, trying to get students to define what is Singapore, define their identity as Singaporeans, but being part of a larger Malaya, which, of course, this is an opportunity to make, make a reference to uh, Tromiati's painting, Bahasa Malayu class or the national language class, where what is written on the blackboard suggests something of a similar nature, like Dimana Awak Tinggal, where do you stay? Where are you? Where is your existence? So, so uh, is, the question is asked in a more general manner in the painting, whereas in the film it's actually being more specific, saying that Singapore is part of Malaya and they should see, especially for the Chinese, so where some of them could see their affiliation even back to their ancestral homeland in China. So they wanted to develop a shift towards their consciousness uh, about who they are towards being Malayans, being Singaporeans in Malaya. Okay. And to even look at the painting further, okay, in response to the reading of Malayan City, we could look at a one element, which is the table. Okay, something as daily as a table, something that is actually a common furniture that you see in a lot of Chinese households of the time, which is given somewhat representation in the Lion City, okay, where a meal takes place, a lot of conversations take place, takes place over the table, which also appears in Chua's painting, interestingly. So he chose this table that was almost like a, a central furniture okay, in many households to, be, to, to actually use it uh, to where a class of uh, the Malay language is actually taking place. Okay? Because the table is not just used for eating. You also see in Lion City where people, uh, little young kids are studying and writing on, in their textbooks in the, on the same table. Okay? Uh, so Lion City is about Singapore and Malaya. And part of the narrative goes to Malaya. And in this film's case, it's Moa. So, uh, so they are the, the, the crew actually went on location to Moa. I think a, a, almost like a quarter of the film was actually shot in Moa. So showing scenes of Moa. And it's another trope that is actually common in films of the time, including in the Malay language films, where there's this dichotomy between kampong and the city. And city is Singapore, and then the kampong or the village is somewhere in rural Malaya. And the city is always seen as some place that is corrupted, where morals are questioned, whereas uh, the Malaya or the rural Malaya is a part where it can return to something like a, a, a more innocent time, where it can return to your roots. Okay? So that is Moa. And in Moa, there's this sequence in Lion City, which shows a group of people, including the female protagonist, okay, doing cycling with a group of people. I call it social cycling. 
Okay, it's something that I've not really investigated. I wish to investigate further because this motive of a people group, people cycling, okay, alongside each other, singing even, appears in many, quite a number of films in, in, in Hollywood, in, in Hong Kong productions, in, in, even in Malay films, and as well as in Chinese language films made here. Because this motive also appears in the next film that I'm going to talk about. Okay? Yet again, social cycling, and next to where we are seated right now, City Hall, Supreme Court. Okay? And this took place in Singapore. But yet again, this is a film that is set in Singapore and Malaya. And the title goes by Lei Sa Su Ni San, or what I would translate as Tears Over the Rubber Hills. So it deals with a subject matter that is related to Lion City rubber, okay, the natural resource that Malaya exports. Okay, this is also produced, released in 1960, and it's a Hokkien film based on a stage play script by Guan Xingyi. Okay, Guan Xingyi is a very important artist, a cultural worker. Uh, he's born in Kinmen, but he became a Singaporean. He's an all-rounder artist. He works in radio, he works in film, he works in Gertai stage, and as well as in television. So he's ended, I think he's ended his career with the SBC. And <clears throat> so he writes scripts, and some, at least one film was actually produced based on his script. So this, which is Lei Sa Shu Ni San, or Tears Over the Rubber Hills. And it's produced by Ing Hua. Ing Hua is actually a film company that's uh, headquartered in Singapore, Go Ing Hua. In fact, one cinema, WE Cinema in Clementi, is actually uh, uh, what used to be Ing Hua. Okay. So this film is again uh, in the Hokkien language, but produced in Hong Kong. So they brought a filming crew to Singapore. The story is about, again, a class divide romance between a rich daughter of a rich man and a rubber plantation worker. And somewhat, this film is lost, but I suspect that the film could be a social realist film because it deals with the unity and struggle of rubber plantation workers, even in publicity materials showing like people, workers, trying to unionize themselves. Okay. And even on the flip side of this publicity leaflet, you'll read, you'll read this, a reflection of the lives of the Malayan people over the decades. So this, yet again, another constant reference to Malaya, okay. Singapore being part of Malaya. Okay. So one film that I really love to actually watch, uh, and really, it's, it's, but it's currently lost. Another lost film is the next film directed by Tang Pik Chi or Yi Shui, which is called uh, Black Gold. So it deals with another natural resource that Malaya exports, which is tin. Okay, black gold refers to tin. So Lion City was produced by Catechris, but I think the film was it was somewhat a moderate success. But I think Cathy decided not to continue to fund his film. So he started a film called Movie Era Film Company, together with none other than <coughs> Ho Kok Ho. I think for those who know, Ho Kok Ho is actually a former president of the Singapore Art Society, which is somewhat like a competitor to Equator Art Society. So where does Yi Shui stand? Uh, we are, I'm still not exactly sure. Okay? Uh, for those who are interested, Ho Kok Ho's conversation, his painting is yeah, upstairs in the gallery. But I digress. Okay. So in the publicity materials, uh, yet another reference to Malaya, a blood and tears story of the Malayan people. Okay, a synopsis of the story goes... Kim Fa is a dulong washer in a tin mine, okay, tin mine worker. Her father was tortured to death under the plot of the collaborator Kong Tian Choi. Her mother was molested by Kong, who finally became her stepfather. Yet again, dealing with class differences. Okay. But the difference with Lion City is that the two lovers, the protagonists, came from a working class background. Whereas Lion City is the romance between someone who is from the, like the capitalist class and uh, working class. So there's a shift in how Yi Shui wants to portray uh, the love story set in Malaya. And so the Qin Yam, the, the guy, is a teen my laborer, is a lover of Kim Fa. His brother, tortured by the Japanese during the occupation, became important. And so, so in some of these films, they were made 
using Malayan themes, ref always refers or commonly refers to the Japanese occupation. Okay, the memory of the Japanese, Japanese occupation was probably still fresh in their minds. Okay, knowing that this is only about twenty years after the occupation. So, and this theme of the sufferings of the ch the people. Chinese people in the Japanese occupation also recurs in the paintings of the time, okay, among the Tramiati's uh, colleagues. So black gold refers to teen. So the film is lost, but we can still see pictures of the film in publicity materials, including this one of the Dulang washers, okay, singing and singing in the Hakka language. I think this one has a lot of Hakka in it, okay. And it's also a theme that has been dealt with uh, marginally, okay, by Chomiati. So this is a, a drawing done by Chomiati of the Teen Minds. Okay, probably he, this was in 1965, okay, showing in the Equator Art Exhibition, Equator Art Society Exhibition, the fourth one. And probably he went on location to the Teen Minds to do a drawing. But I have not come across any uh, drawings of his of his that deal with the, or rather, representations or depictions of the laborers. Okay, there are somewhat or more picturesque images of the scene and scenes that you will encounter if you visit the tin mines. But the act of going to the place to actually get an appreciation of the environment, okay, was actually pretty much uh, popular among cultural workers of the time, including Yi Shui himself. So you'll see Yi Shui taking photographs, group photographs of the crew, the filming crew, amongst the workers who were working at the, the tin plantation on the left, and in the right uh, image case, among tea plant, uh, rather tea plantation. So it's tin on the left, tea plantation on the right. And I think he was conscious of this term that people were using of the time, tea and shen huo, or what I would translate as experiencing life among the masses, experiencing the lives of the working class. So you have an artist, you want to portray the masses, you want to give voice to the masses, you would have to immerse yourself in amongst the laboring class, the working class, to get a, the most accurate sense of their lives and to create, I mean, what became social realist works. So this is pretty much a, a an approach that they were adopting, Ti and Shen Huo. Okay, you will see this term recurring many, many times in different fields, theatre, in literature, in film, okay, even up to the 70s. So Yi Shui, so Black Go, I think, was not a, like a huge success. So he, he actually uh, started another film company and went on to pro uh, produce two more films which are unfortunately also lost, and I think they were never released, but with, uh, based on the accounts of some of the actors and actresses, they were completed, and they were even better than Lion City. So it will be really a miracle, and a, and a very one worth celebrating if we were ready to uh, discover the existence of these two films. Name Young Widow, film on location at Fraser's Hill, and move over Bentong Hill, somewhere in Pahang, Okay, Bukit Raka, on location in the primary forest of Malaya. Okay, so hard to comment further because we know the storylines, but we can't look at the actual film. But something I would like to point out in the publicity of this film. So when they publicized this, they were hoping to release it, but eventually it's not. By this company called Chong Ye, Zhong Yi. Okay, take the logo. Okay, so now I'll speak more about this film organization or film company, okay, Chong Ge. So this film company existed from 1960s, as early as 1963, but it has went, went through many like reincarnations or revamping, uh, reorganization. So different logos used as well. So Chong Ge uh, has three logos, okay, going through different periods, coming under different leaders, eventually ending with overseas movie. So, so it, some of the staff or the resources of Chonggei actually went, were somewhat transferred to overseas movie. So for those who are film watchers or cinema goers as late as the 1990s, you will be very familiar with, with this brand, okay? overseas movie, Zhongqiao Yuanxian. Okay? But what I'll be speaking about is actually a third 
uh, incarnation, rather the second incarnation, Chonggei, the third period. Okay, the logo that you will see on many publicity materials, okay, of films that they were distributing. Distributing, they are very well known for distributing Hong Kong left wing films, Hong Kong left wing films. Okay, Chonggei logo, okay, shown in Singapore. Okay. And this is actually one of the films that was produced in Hong Kong by a left-wing film company. Okay, in this case, Changcheng, or the Great War Movie Enterprises in Hong Kong. The film title is Jing Se Nian Hua, The Golden Age. And I was, tons of words, okay, but I'll just pick up one line. So what is the film about? It's a social realist, cautionary romance epic production. Okay, so they will state very explicitly these are social realist films, okay, and they are mean meant to espouse very mild socialist agenda, okay, because of censorship, okay, and they can't really uh, rather distribute or show films that are really uh, distinctly communist. Although these films were said to be funded by the communist uh, government or the party back in mainland China, so they were distributing. Uh, cultural propaganda through the channel, through Hong Kong to Singapore and, and Malaya, Malaysia, essentially through the Chonggei organization. Okay. In fact, before Chonggei organization, Shaw and Cathay were distributing the left-wing films, but something happened in 1968 okay, with the influence, influence from Taiwan that stopped Shaw and Cathay from distributing these kinds of left-wing films. And so Chonggei took over. Okay, and became the main party or organization doing this. Okay. Another publicity material. Well, this is really unusual for the times, okay, to distribute a film in Singapore or Malaysia with such a material. Dr drenched in like blood red, okay, speaking about fish a story about fishermen, capital, anti capitalists. And this is produced by another left wing film company in Hong Kong called the Phoenix Feng Huang in Pian Shi. So and uh, so there are three main left wing companies. Uh. In short, we call them Chang Feng Xing, okay, Chang Cheng, Great War, Feng Huang, Phoenix, and Xing Lian, okay, Chang Feng Xing. Okay, so Chonggei was very well known for distributing films. And if you were to know, like uh, in the exhibition upstairs, uh, uh, Ko Yung was speaking about Equator Art Society members going to film screenings. And I think they would have gone to the film screenings of these left-wing films. Okay? And in many of the publicity materials, you will see one term that's constantly being mentioned, which is healthy content. There's this, uh, this concept about healthy, being healthy. Okay? Obviously, in opposition or in contrast to the films that were very popular of the time, which is about like sex and violence, depiction of sex and violence. Okay, which to some of these cultural workers were somewhat sub too subversive, somewhat degenerate. And in fact, that is the opinion that the head of the organization, uh, uh, what, 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 what he had in mind. So I came across this newspaper report in Nanyang Shangpao titled, Chonggei Organization Sets Up Production Unit to Urgently Produce Films with Local Themes in Time for the ASEAN Film Festival. Reviews the head of the organization, Lim, Lim Jit Sun, Lim Ru Sun, okay, to the Cheng Chonggei Convention. In the report, there was a subheading, a service society, okay, film as a service society. So Lim thought that films showing in local cinemas were overly commercial and presented a corrupt and degenerate culture, a gray culture, a yellow culture. Okay, for those who, are, who know the, all the, there was a, a movement called anti-yellow culture, okay, even setting up a anti-yellow cultural council back in the 1950s. So, but it has taken on a new term uh, in the 70s, grey culture, they call it hui, something devoid of colour is grey. So this terms, huang se wen hua, hui se wen hua, hui an wen hua, okay, is a, a term that was constantly in circulation among cultural workers of the time, especially those who were left-leaning. So to address the dearth of healthy films, yet he mentioned healthy films again, Lim thought that it was pertinent that Chonggei themselves embarked on producing their own socially conscious films. So they went on to produce three Mandarin films that were of a social realist nature. Okay, so the first two were actually produced 
by using, with the help and assistance of a Hong Kong technical crew. Because uh, by then, Shaw Brothers, Cathay Curris have already closed down. So there are no major film studios uh, consistently producing films by 1975. So Chong Lim Jit Soon wanted to revive that and he wanted to get expertise from Hong Kong to actually get the local talent to understudy them. And then, so the first two actually by Hong Kong uh, directed, okay, the technical, but using a local cast, Singapore, Malay, Malaysian cast. Okay, the first one is called Crime Does Not Pay, Yi Jia Zi Zhu. It's critics of murdered patriarchy, uh, family oppression and drug abuse. The second film is called Hypocrites, Hong Tang Shi Jia. It's a satirical comedy juxtaposing families from two different social classes. Hard to comment further, because these two films, unfortunately, are also lost, according to a report, uh, or rather someone I interviewed, they are lost to a fire in a Hong Kong warehouse. But the third film that Chong Gay produced still exists. So it's the third and final one that they made, okay, produced by a majority local Singapore-Malaysian cast and crew. So the directors, the camera person, uh, other than the lighting crew, actors, actresses were all from Singapore and Malaysia. So the title is Two Sides of the Bridge, Chao de Liang An. And in a preview of the film by the journalist in Ming Bao, in July 1976, he, he says the film reflects real life. Okay, I think it's worthwhile to actually give you a synopsis of the film. Okay, the, so the film chronicles the relationship of a young couple who faces the pressures of living in a rapidly transforming and materialistic Singapore. While Ling Feng, the female protagonist, perseveres at her day job in a textile factory and attending night classes to improve herself, Ru Fei, the male protagonist, is lured by a high-paying job at a money lending firm which eventually entraps him in risky investment schemes. So, to evade his debts, he returns to Kelantan. So he's a migrant from Malaysia to Singapore. So he returns to escape to Kelantan and finds brief respite before re becoming embroiled in a ploy with drug traffickers. Yet again, dealing with drug abuse, anti-drug. So in the first film that Chang'e produced, also, also about drug, drug taking. Okay, people, uh, very anti-drug abuse. It's this theme recurs, or rather it's reflected in this film as well. Okay, we can look at the, the publicity of this film, hey, Chao De Liang An, or Two Sides of the Bridge, produced by Chong Ge. You see the logo. Okay. In fact, it premiered at the ASEAN Film Festival in 1976. And very not many mentions of like it's a social realist film, that is a healthy film. Very simply portraying the lives of youth. Okay, so you don't see any depiction of the working class, people like raising their arms or giving expressions that are very melodramatic in a struggle. It's quite positive, uplifting. It's about youth. All the scenes taken from the film are somewhat not very provocative. Very interesting, because this is in 1976, mid-1970s. And mid-1970s was the period where a lot of cultural organizations were actually being, especially the left-leaning ones, were suspected of having communist influence, including Guo Pao Kun's uh, perform, performing arts school. So I think they were really careful in the way they publicized the film then. Okay? But if you watch the film, there are many traces, and you see roots, of uh, social realist or even socialist realistic themes okay, uh, in the film. So I should mention here that the film is co-directed by um, Singaporean Malaysians, Lim Ming Chiu and Chen Changming. I'll be speaking more about them later. Okay? So let's watch, uh, see some experts from the film, okay? uh, rather film stills from the film. So the film still exists in the form of a VHS tape. I don't, we have not found traces of the film reels Okay, unfortunately, so this is the best quality, image quality that we could get. The title of the film, Two Sides of the Bridge. And in the beginning of the film, there's this scene of a picnic where people are dancing, people are singing, okay, and accompanied by an accordion. 
Okay, you don't really see this in films of other times where there's a scene where people sing and dance. Accordion, and I've just come across a, a essay writing recently which speaks about the accordion as a political tool. So the accordion, I'm not an expert on this, but I, I read that it has this folk religions, origins in Russia and then being introduced into China and being used by the communists in China as a propaganda tool. So by the military, so because it's a very mobile instrument, yet very, uh, so it's like all, all kinds of instruments in one. You can bring it to different parts, in to rural parts of China, to, uh, and it was really adopted by the CCP government, used as a propaganda tool, and that influence, I think, came to Singapore and, and Malaysia, Malaya, and that is given representation in this film. Okay, even that the, the tune that they were using uh, is very peculiar. It's, it takes on the Eastern Europe Russian melody. Okay, interesting. And so the female protagonist was actually asked to sing uh, like a very poetic kind of song. And some of the lyrics uh, has this, one of the lyrics has this line, the fishermen mend their nets under the coconut trees. Has this imagination, this portrayal of labor together with the idyllic, okay? So, which, which makes me want to make this connection to trust paintings of the time that was creating in the 70s of laborers working in an idyllic environment, okay? And the, the overall mood is someone that's picturesque, okay? Very much different from the kinds of visualization of labor in his paintings and drawings created in the 50s, which is more stark which is really shows people struggling and, and going through hard labor. But by the 70s, I think that has changed. Okay? And somewhat, this is similar to what is being portrayed in Two Sides of the Bridge as well. And of course, we can make a comparison to epic poem Malaya, always this speaker or this figure espousing uh, ideas, I mean, Malaya about the <coughs> Singapore, about the like there are seagulls flying upon the sea, such things. Okay, but this motif also appears in two sides of the bridge, and I would actually even say that this has echoes of uh, what used to be a political singing and dancing. So the idea of having picnics in a rural area, okay, singing and dancing is is can be seen as propaganda of back in the nineteen fifties. So I've come across reports in the special branch, the police special branch reports in, when Singapore was still a colony. So I came across this report in 1956, April, uh, March, April. Chinese youth and cultural bodies have been consp conspicuously quiet about concerts for songs and dances, require police, police permits, and their place they have been organizing picnics and long weekends in the rural areas, at which they have held discussion groups lived a collective life and performed the usual songs and dances of communist origin. I think they, probably they're exaggerating. They, I mean, in their eyes, from the perspective of the special branch, they, they see anything that's left-leaning as communist. Okay? So, in fact, some of these picnics or long weekends, collective living, is being portrayed in epic poem of Malaya. And that's, that's my reading. And another report from 1957, after the clampdown of September, October 1956, okay, these picnics, or what they deem as subversive picnics, were still taking place. So Singapore General Employees Union, somewhat related, uh, at, at, at that point, uh, connected to PAP, okay, they organized a picnic attended by about 300 persons at Pastries on the 19th. Communist behavior of a particularly marked nature was observed and one of the songs bordered closely on sedition. The picnic was attended by a large number of Chinese of student age who appeared to play a prominent part in the organization. So, workers, students taking part in picnic, that is also portrayed in epic poem Malaya. You see both students and workers uh, forming a circle around the speaker who is raising his arm, uh, rather uh, promoting a consciousness of a Malayan culture. Okay, so, picnic, Singing and dancing portrayed in Two Sides of the Bridge. I think that could be like a delayed projection or echoes of a time that they were fervently 
uh, wanting to be anti-colonial, wanting to seek the independence of Malaya and Singapore. Okay, so Clusa the Bridge was a, like a delayed projection of that. Other scenes from the film, okay, you show factory workers, and this is the point to make a comparison with Lion City. You show actors, or rather factory workers entering and exiting, exiting the factory. Okay, at particular times, so uh, wage labor, okay, working at specific times where you're paid by the hour, and this reality among the working class is portrayed in both films, okay, or what we deem or call the regimentation of labor. And this idea, regimentation, is also what you can use to read this particular painting by Traumayati, Workers in a Canteen, where something as simple as the act of eating, something that's very daily, just feeding yourself, is also uh, portrayed on reg regimental lines, okay? Speak, uh, eating a long, really long desk. So Chua chose to actually not depict a working class scene, not in the production line, but in a canteen, but having that same graphic look of lines, regimentation, okay? Um, but that's my reading. So in the film, you see I mean, depiction of workers working on that production line. And that is the point where the protagonist, one of the protagonists, the male protagonist, start to question himself, do I continue working in such an environment? Do I con want to continue to be a laborer? And that's when he said, uh, do you want to have a fortunate life? And he exited the, the factory, he quit, and he went to become, to work for the finance company and became uh, written with that. Okay, so this film, uh, the narrative follows that trajectory. Uh, the female protagonist, Ling Feng, uh, attends night classes as well. Uh, yet again, a theme that you see in Lion City and in Two Sides of the Bridge. Okay, uh, the class in Lion City is a ge geography class. This one is a poetry class. Okay, so where it speaks about dawn, uh, talk, teaching a class based on a poem called Dawn. It's an active poem that praises the sun. Okay. And in both Lion City and Two Sides of the Bridge, you have uh, instances where the female protagonist would exit or reject and escape from the capitalist world. Because she attends a party hosted by the finance company, and there's an incident, and she runs away from it. Okay, that's in Two Sides of the Bridge. But in Lion City, she walks away. Because the man she was in love with is the son of a rich person. Okay, so she's somewhat amb more amb ambivalent, so she walks away. Okay, and there's some conciliation that takes place between the working class uh, girl and the rich man's son. Okay, whereas in Two Sides of the Bridge, both the protagonists were from the working class. And so the man momentarily enters the capitalist world and the female chose to run away from it at any encounters of it, okay? So there's this class antagonism that's suggested in Lion City, okay, where the male protagonist will say, I'm tired, this is a world belonging to the wealthy people, okay? Other than that, there's also national antagonism because this is a time when 1976, so Singapore has separated from Malaysia, okay? From in 1965. So she, he came from Kelantan. So if he has to stay on, he has to apply to get married so he can stay on on a more permanent basis because he's a Malaysian citizen. And so that is expressed in the film. Okay, very distinctly separation. And this also is also because of the director. Li Ming Chiu himself came from Kelantan. He's also somewhat like a migrant, Kelantan moving to Singapore. Okay, so he has probably certain lamentations okay, about Singapore being separated from Malaya, Malaysia. And that is expressed in the film. So the film title, Two Sides of the Bridge, the bridge actually refers to the causeway. Okay, this is something that's yet to, uh, to be further uh, investigated. Why is the causeway called the Tie Chiao, the Da Tie Chiao? Okay, like people of the past, I think they don't use Chang Di or the causeway, they use Tie Chiao. Why is that so? I mean, I've, I, 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 I've yet to really find out why. Okay, so more about Li Ming Chiu. So this is Li Ming Chiu. So this is an article I found from a 1991 art, uh, article. 
and he writes about, the, it's like a summary of the local theater plays scene in the 1960s and 70s, of which it was a major part of. Okay, so Ling Ming Chu is a journalist, writer, director. He writes editor, uh, journalist editor for Ming Bao, for Xinzhou Ru Bao, for Lian He Wan Bao. And that credential is also held by Tan Ming Cheng Ming, or Chen Chang Ming. Okay, he's also a journalist, a film critic, a stage director, both having experience in theatre before coming together to direct two sides of the bridge. So this photograph shows Chen Chang Ming actually directing uh, two female actresses in la two sides of the bridge in the factory. So Chen Ch uh, rather Ling Ming, Ling Ming Chiu is well known for being uh, I mean a theatre playwright, taking on different pseudonyms, one of which is Si Ke Yang. So he's well known for his associations with the Kangle Musical Association, Kangle Yin Yue Hui, which was founded in 1954, very left-leaning, and an advocate of socialism and art, but forced to close in 1970. Okay, so Lin Ming Chiu, oh, sorry, Lin Ming Chiu. Uh, this is a cover of a special publication in conjunction with the theater play Melody of Life. And this cover is in fact designed by Ko Sa Yong, who is a colleague of Kwamiati uh, in the Equator Art Society. Uh, Ko Xiaoyang was also known to have made art, like graphic art, for another film production, or a theater company, or a theater group called the Singapore Art Experimental Studio, or in Chinese, Xinjiabo Siyan Ji Chang, of which a very active member is actually Chen Changming. Okay, uh, Tan Chang Ming, the co-director of Two Sides of the Bridge. So, in my opinion, if you, if anyone wish to unpack what Two Sides of the Bridge is, has to look at the the productions or the whatever went on in the theater scene. Okay, in the, of the nineteen seventies. Okay, these are all left, somewhat left leaning, uh, theater produ uh, theater production groups. And at the same time, of which Guo Pao Kong was also active in the scene. Okay, and there are a constant interaction between all these groups. So I was looking at all these um, publications by different Chinese theater companies of the 1970s. I was looking for traces of their interaction with film, the film community, and indeed I found some. So in one, this publication of the Singapore Performing Arts School by Ko Pao, uh, founded by Ko Pao Kun with uh, Go Lei Kuan, his wife, 1966, a performance of Alan Seymour is the one day of the year, Kao Yan. I found this article in the publication, On New Wave Cinema. Wow, okay. <laughs> and who was it written by? By Zhong Yu, Zhou, Zhong Yu, Zhong Yu who is a, which is a pseudonym of this person called Chong Kok Seng. Okay, so he was writing about the European New Wave Cinema, French New Wave Cinema, and he makes it in, in that, essay which comes in the form of a question and answer format. So he posed this question, is Xing Chao or New Wave Cinema xie yi or xie shi? Okay, xie yi, suggestive expressions, or xie shi, meaning uh, object, realistic documentation. So he says New Wave Cinema to him is suggestive, subjective expression xie yi on the foundation of realistic, objective xie shi documentation. So in his writings, as I came to realize, there's this constant reference to xian shi. How do you express the reality? What is, how does film portray reality? This constant questioning in his writings and eventually the films that he made. So I was very curious about Zhong Yu, Zhou Yu, Zhong Yu, okay, Chong Kok Sing. Who this person is? What has he done? Why? has this article appeared in Guo Pao Kun's uh, theatre company's publication. So I found a few articles that mentioned him where he was involved, including this one uh, about a uh, documentation of discussion about the Taiwanese film Sinu Isla or Four Moods, okay, between Chong Kok Sing, Ying Pei An and Mai Ke, which appears in a literary journal published by Ying Pei An. Okay. A uh, very renowned uh, literary figure who started grassroots uh, book book room, and in that article, I found a photograph of Song Yu, okay, Chong Kok Sing. His name is Chong Guo Sheng. He's an all-rounder again. He's a poet. He's a novelist. He's a filmmaker, and he's also a film writer. 
he has published as early as 1961 called Ying Pian de and I, in, and I quote from a rather long article. So it advocates film artists experiencing life among the laboring masses. The best portray what's admirable and beautiful in human personalities. To learn from living experiences among the common people and nurture progressive and classist ways of thinking. Rather left meaning, in, in my opinion. So, but that is as early as 1961 when he was still only 21 years old. I think there's a shift in the way he views how filmmaking should be because by the 1970s, I think because of his exposure to new wave cinema, and he, so he's writing articles on Godard, on uh, Fellini, mentioning Antonio Lee, Akira Kurosawa, Alien Rene. So I think his concept about what filmmaking should be has shifted. Okay, this uh, article is appearing in Student Weekly. Okay. He's also written an article called The Return to the Silent Film Era. So he feels strongly about film should be silent as they were when they were uh, first started in 1895, 100, uh, uh, from now 100 years ago. And he even gives provocative st statements like, true cinema doesn't speak. Okay? But, and he has another article called My Underground Film. So other than writing films, he made films. Okay, and he terms them underground films or experimental films. Okay, so I'll take some excerpts from this article. That's him as his movie camera, 16 mil, 16mm 16 camera. So in 1966, he made a documentary titled Shi. Okay, I would translate it as Eclipse or Corrosion. Okay, he says it's his first underground film, experimental film. On 16 mil, silent but with intertitles. He also has a number of spontaneous short documentaries, somewhat less structured than Eclipse, recordings of subjective impressions and images. And this films at what uh, he, he felt underground films should be, that they should be immersed among the people. Sun Lu Ming Jian Ding. They should subjectively capture the small events of life, Sheng Huo Zhong Xiao Shi Jian, even expressing emotional reality. Okay. Uh, Okay, that's what his opinion about what underground films should be, what documentary underground films should be, uh, what films that he hoped to create. And through the process of making films, he found that editing is the soul and essence of cinema. And I would like to take this time, opportunity to mention the film that you're going to watch after the talk later, Hussein Hanif. Uh, he will actually agree with what Chong Kok Seng is saying here, that editing is the soul and essence of cinema. Because Hussein Hanif, uh, the director of G Village Neighbors, Jiran Sekampong, you're going to watch later. It also came from a very strong background in editing. So he was an editor before he became a director. So the strength of his film is actually in the editing. So I might say likewise for the films of Chong Kok Singh, if it still exists. I've not come, uh, I've not have, having the courage to actually approach him, whether he's still alive, I'm not sure. And whether the film does exist, uh, it, it's for me to find out. At the end of the article, he said that he only made one film, Eclipse. He couldn't continue because of uh, it's just financially impractical. But uh, you, uh, later on, he, you re I realized that he was still making films, okay, but for commercial purposes. So he, there was this advertisement uh, where he published in Sight and Sound okay, or by the BFI okay, as early as 19, 1976 where he publicized himself as a young Chinese producer, director from Singapore. He's born in Singapore, by the way. Experience in documentary production, wanting to look for assignments. Okay, so at that point of time, although people who are conversant in Singapore film history will see this 80s, 70s, 80s as a lull in film production, but I believe there are a lot of film practitioners okay, taking on a lot of commercial uh, assignments and even making films independently outside of the Singapore television, uh, outside of the major film studios. So some of them would have been part of the Singapore Senior Film Club and participating in uh, a series or annual Singapore video competition, both open to the amateurs and to professionals. And so I was looking at amongst these films, documentaries, films, feature films, or rather fiction films produced by the, this community of filmmakers, independent, okay? So they were working outside of the system, like rather the mainstream television. And I came across two titles. One is The Day with the Laborers, okay?
Okay, we one of the first films to speak about migrant labor. Okay, that's being made in Singapore, and the other one called Alling Sign, about uh, street hawkers in Chinatown, and many of the street hawkers who were actually former a uh, Samsui woman. Okay, formerly Samsui woman. So, I I shan't speak more about this. Um, but if interested, the video tapes are still in the Lee Kong Chen reference library, and I heard that Asian Film Archive might show a few of these short films in their coming short film festival. Okay, so do keep a lookout for it. Okay, so more about this still from Orlang Sign, in short, on location in Chinatown, where the documentary filmmaker interviews the street hawkers. Okay, and I make a reference, of course, to Traumati's uh, paintings. Okay, Traumati so give like a uh, impression of uh, like seeking likeness, but I don't think, and we 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 are open to actually. Uh, imposing our own stories uh, on the figures that's represented in Trust painting, whereas the documentary goes a step further to actually uh, interview them and find out about who they are, what their experiences were. So Traumati's painting gives a, a certain stops at a certain certain point. Okay, and he has paintings as well of the Samsui woman at work. Okay, but yet portray it again, to my opinion, in a very picturesque manner. Okay. But this is a time to actually bring in another film, okay? Another group group of films, documentary films that were made in Singapore at the time, and I they were made by foreigners, okay? In this case, uh, a Dutch filmmaker called Edward Lycan. So, so he he makes experimental films, and I think there's a lot to be said about what some of these overseas artists or filmmakers were doing in Singapore at the time, okay? And uh, whether we can gather all these films together and talk about them. But uh, I will just, um, I made contact with Edward Locke and actually uh, get him to uh, share his films with me. Okay? And I think there's room for comparison about the films that he was making together uh, against uh, Traumatis paintings. Okay? And um, so, uh, Edward Locke is actually, he was in Singapore for a period of time in 1980. Okay? And he was in the midst of moving okay, from Paris to Tokyo. Yeah, stopped over in Singapore, stayed for a few days, shot films almost on an almost daily basis, documenting scenes from street life, buildings, objects, and then intermixing them with images of his family. Okay? But he completed two films, two titles, book, Double Happiness and Bukitima. So, uh, Edward Lycan has said that he has never shown these films in public. Okay? So, I'm about to share one film with you, the short film, Double Happiness, so this is in fact the premiere of the film anywhere in the world. It's an international premiere. Okay? But before that, Bokitima is also another film that he made. It's one hour long, so I'm not going to show it, but this is so some scenes from the film, Steals. It's a personal alchemic documentary okay? via an outsider's lens. Okay? But Double Happiness. Uh, six minutes long, it's shot in a cemetery. It's a meditative film. No narration, but it's a soundtrack. Okay, and it just images almost methodically of tombstone paraphernalia from funeral rites to the surrounding landscape and eventually, uh, finally, the labor of cemetery workers and grave builders. So I did an email correspondence with him and I asked him why double happiness. He, he, he just gave a very simple answer. The film title could suggest the joy of being born in this world and the joy of living it at the end of life. Okay, so with that, uh, this is the international premiere of Double Happiness.
another peculiar, peculiar film, okay? It's a documentary, but it's somewhat experimental, uh, devoid of narration, shot in a cemetery, and I believe we'll be hard-pressed to find another film that was shot in the cemetery of the time, given that people might have some opinion, opinions about doing a film other than uh, home movies. Okay, we might have to wait until uh, Tan Bin Bin's moving house okay, for that to be where films of, made up of a documentary has a really more distinct meaning other than personal like movie, uh, home movie filmmaking. But other than that, uh, so I was looking for traces of documentaries, experimental documentaries in uh, Singapore filmmaking. And another example that uh, a name you should be familiar, or uh, rather, to know all of is Rajendra Gaur. Okay, this is not a chance for me to speak about him because uh, his his film Eyes, okay, and a number of his films will be uh, screened in the coming uh, AF it's Asian Film Archives Short Films Festival. I think uh, do keep a lookout for it. Where I think it's another, I think more uh, uh, appropriate platform to speak out about his films. So I'll just make a quick mention here. So this is 1960s, 1970s, 80s, and uh, Chong Kok Sing made a film in 1966, Experimental 1966, Eyes came out in 1967. So at the same time, this is where the next film, the film you're gonna watch later by Hussein Hanif appeared in 1966. So I'll speak very briefly about Hussein Hanif's career. I think he deserves a full retrospective uh, in, in, in the future and in the coming future. So I will group his films uh, into two two, uh, so he made films for Cathay Caris, okay, coming from a film editing background, uh, working in Cathay, but elevating, being elevated to the position of a director in 1961, and so he was known for making uh, anti-feudal uh, period dramas. Okay, to me they are political allegories, like a social critic using stories of the past to comment on the political social political situation in Singapore and Malaysia, uh, Malaya then. So it's very renowned for making Hang Jabat, okay, the treasonous uh, rebel in the Hang Tua uh, uh, story, okay, from Sejarah Melayu, okay, based on a, hung, uh, a radio play and a stage play called Hang Jabat commits treason, okay, by Ali Aziz, and this narrative of Hang Jabat taking becoming the new anti-hero, okay, uh, it, it's been uh, portrayed in different uh, cultural works, okay, in film theatre, in, in writings, in film, in Hang Jabat, okay. But this this is Hussein Hanif's, uh, part of his filmography, they were on period, period films, okay, but he also made a number of uh, so contemporary social dramas, of which Jiran Sakampong Village Neighbours is part of, okay, so, uh, if you have time, I will urge you to watch some of them. Uh, they are really, for me, social observations and critique. Many of them are satires, and very distinctly, many of them were shot on locations. So they are actually important, very precious documentary of the living environment, especially of the Malay community then. Okay? But his stories, I think the narratives cut through all segments of the Singaporean society, including the Chinese and Indians as well. Okay? But So we are showing... Uh, Jiran Sekampong today, but there are two, a pair of um, comedies, okay, satirical comedies that I already urge you to watch, okay, and so this is actually a film still, so he was actually uh, making a parody of a political rally, okay? <laughs> okay, very funny films, okay, but could be offensive for some people, okay, but today we are watching something that's probably more, taking on a more serious tone, and the film still shows Orang Kaya or Rich Man, a voyeur. Okay, so in fact, I think through the film, he's asking fellow artists or even all of us to actually look at the people amongst us, not through a voyeuristic lens, but through to really immerse yourself in the community and really to understand. And actually for artists to actually get experience and portray them in their works, in their films. So I'll end my presentation with a quote from him. Okay, an interview he gave, uh, he did with Berita Harian and at the launch of the filming of the film. Okay, Jiran Sekampong is a story created by the director Hussein Hanif based on his experiences and, and encounters. According to him, such experiences should be unpacked, processed, and revealed to the public as it is our duty as members of society to recognize and acknowledge the different realities of life around us. So with, that, uh, with this, I really would want to see, I hope you will do likewise, to see Jiran Sekampong, Village Neighbours, as a social realist film in Singapore filmmaking. Thank you very much.